Okay, let's uh, let's dive into the Word of God here a little bit today. So I was thinking about what to say. What do you say on Memorial Day in a church, or how do you how do you incorporate our faith into what we do in remembering those who have fallen? There's a theme throughout the entire Scripture that is so prevalent, and it's exactly why we have things like Memorial Day and Veterans Day. And that theme is this, remembrance. All through the scriptures, we are told to do things to remember what God has done. All through the scriptures. And I want to look at one of those today and look at what that means, the purpose of it, and what can, what can we draw from that today? What can we draw from that that will help us in our society today? So let's look at Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. Give you some background to this passage. Moses has passed away. And God has now made Joshua the leader of all of Israel to go into the land of Canaan that God has given them and to take possession of the land. Joshua is the leader. And right before they do, the very first city that they have to go, they have to cross the Jordan River, and then they've got to stop at this place called Jericho. But the problem is it's flood season. We have no idea what that's like around here, do we? Flood season. River is out of its banks. Some scholars would tell you that at some point it's 18 feet deep. It's huge. And the only way to get from where they are to where God told them to go to take possession of the land in Jericho was to cross the river. Uh, they don't have bridges at the time. They didn't have bridges. They just had to walk across. But the river's flowing. And God says, you don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. What I want you to do is I want you to put the Ark of the Covenant, and I want you to put it on poles, and I want the priests to go and put their foot in the water. <laughs> I'm not going to promise anything. I just want them to put their foot in the water. And the priests go, and they put their foot in the water, and the water begins to stand on its end, and God opens up a path of dry land through this raging river. And now this scene is is the priests are standing in the middle of the river with walls of water on both sides. That's the scene. Imagine that. Imagine standing in the Little Sioux River right now, right in the smack dab in the middle of it at flood stage, and there's just walls of water on both sides of you and dry land underneath you. My first inclination of that would be that let's hurry up and get everybody across so this thing doesn't crash down on us, right? That, like, let's hurry up. And get everyone through, but that's not what God said. Let's read Joshua chapter 4. It said, And when all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, and from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. And then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. And when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan. According to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest being, bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished. That the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. 
The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel. As Moses had told them, about 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle. To the plains of Jericho, on that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times, of times to come, What do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan. For you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and you may fear the Lord your God forever. So there's this idea of Moses, or of Joshua telling these people, we're going to build an altar across the way. And there's a couple of purposes in mind there. If you look Twice in that passage, it says that when your children ask in days to come, what do these stones mean? You be careful to tell them what the Lord did in your place right here. Building memorials or building things that we can remember, tangible things. In order for them to have a purpose, one of those purposes is to teach our children what God has done ahead of us. For a number of years, when I met my wife, I, keep in mind, I met my wife, started dating, proposed, and got married in less than a year. And when I met my wife, I was a smoker. And if you want to know what it takes to quit smoking, I always tell people proper motivation. And my proper motivation was a beautiful young lady that told me she would not marry me if I was a smoker. And so on my wedding day, before I walked to the church, and the best part about it was it was 77 degrees on January 26th in 2002. I can tell you that in Jefferson, Iowa. I, in January 26th, I walked to the church in shorts, puffing away on my last cigarette of my life. And for years, I carried, I took one of those cigarettes and I emptied out all the stuff out of it and I flattened it out. And that was the bookmark of my Bible to remind me what the Lord did for me. I got a few looks. <laughs> Not everyone appreciated that. But it was a reminder to me, and it was a reminder for those who would ask me, what is that doing there for me to go and tell them this is what God did. He delivered me from the bondage of addiction to cigarettes. It was a constant reminder. And we need to do that in our lives over and over and over again. Every time that you feel God has done something in your life where he has radically provided, where he has set you free from something, you need something that you can have in your sight that people can look at and they can ask, what is that? Why is that there? And you can say, that's there because the Lord is mighty. And he did something for me here. We have another one hanging on our wall in our house. When my wife was in surgery and she was just about, I didn't think we were going to make it. I thought I was going to raise four kids on my own. And I, I was going through some stuff and I was just telling people about all these verses that God was doing. And someone went and created a shadow box with all these verses that I'd shared from that time and put them in a shadow box and that goes with us wherever we go so that we always have a reminder in our wall that God saves and God is mighty. 
But we also have a biblical example of what happens when we don't do this with our children. See, God told Joshua, you do this and you do this so that your children will know that God is mighty. You do this. But they didn't. They did not share these stories. They did not raise up their generation behind. But how do I know that? Because let's turn to Joshua chapter 2. Or excuse me, Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, we have one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. One of the saddest passages of, of the Bible is here in Judges tap, chapter 2. Joshua has passed away at this point. And they're getting ready to go into the land. And they're going to drive out the people of the land. But they didn't drive the people of the land out. And so Judges is one of the saddest books of the Bible. Because here's the way the book of Judges goes. The children of Israel did not obey the Lord. God got mad. And he sent an oppressing nation to oppress the children of Israel. The children of Israel would then cry out to God. And God would send them a judge. Someone to deliver them from the oppressors that were there. And they lived that way good for a while. And then guess what? That was chapter 3. Chapter 4, Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. God sent an oppressor. They cried out to God. God sent a judge. They were delivered. They lived that way for a while. And then the same thing over and over and over again. And we find out why in Judges chapter 2. Starting in verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people of Israel with each to his inheritance to take possession. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. Who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnath Haris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And here's the sad verse. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. That to me is one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. Joshua's generation saw some of the most miraculous, awesome, powerful things of God's deliverance. And when they were all gone, they did not raise a generation that knew the Lord. That is why we must be careful to build, when we build memorials, it is not just so that we can create an institution that we always, that well, we're just going to keep on doing that forever. We build memorials so that we can tell our children this is what God did here. It's important. And all through the Bible, all through the Bible, primarily the Old Testament, but even in the book of Revelation, we get this command. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord. I can give you more, but I'm going to just give you a few examples. Deuteronomy 4, 9. Deuteronomy 9, 7, and 8. Isaiah 51, 12, and 13. 2 Kings 17, 38. Judges 8, 33, and 34. Exodus 32, 1 through 8. Over and over and over again, that phrase, be careful that you do not forget the Lord. Be careful. That's why we honor those who have given their lives in service for this country. Because they served the Lord. They did what was asked of them. But it was God who provided the victory. It was God who provided the victory. So I will stand here proud of men in my life like Benjamin Robert Carmen who gave his life in Iraq so that I can stand here today and proclaim the gospel. I will stand here proud for guys like Matt Nielsen, who died in Afghanistan for the very same reason. Both my grandfathers in World War II 
my Uncle Jerry in Vietnam. And I will tell my children that whenever freedom was in jeopardy, there were men that loved this country enough and loved them enough to pay the ultimate price. And I will not forget to honor the Lord in the victory. And in today's day and age, I think there's something that we can gain from this. I think there's something that we can see. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the country isn't exactly a united front right at the moment. Our country is a divided disaster. You can't even walk and make a joke in our world right now in fear that someone would be offended by that joke and then want to be in this combat of arms with you over your beliefs. In today's day and age, we must remember that the Christian's call is to submit to governing authorities. To submit. So we have an entire group of churches that are sitting here telling, you know, bragging about the fact that we should overthrow the government or that we should stand up and rise against the government. And the Christian's call in the scriptures is to submit to our governing authorities. And one of the most, probably the most patriotic person that has ever existed for this country is a man by the name of George Washington. If you ever come in my office, you will see a picture of George Washington kneeling down before his horse, getting ready to pray this prayer. It's actually a prayer that he sent in a circular that he sent to all the, all the governors of the states right after... So they just won the, Civil, the Revolutionary War, but he had not become the first president yet. So this fledgling nation was vulnerable. It was vulnerable. And his prayer for this nation tells you what his heart was for the people. I want to read a portion of it to you, an excerpt. I now make it my earnest prayer that God would have the United States in his holy protection. That he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to the government. To entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another. For their fellow citizens of the United States at large, and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field. And finally, that he would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper, temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. And without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. Amen. Did you get it? And in order for us to be a happy nation, its citizens must avail themselves in brotherly love for each other. I think that's pretty sound advice that we have fallen horribly short in in the last 10 years. That when possible, when the government does not ask us to violate the scriptures, when possible, that we would submit ourselves to the governing authorities in our lives. That we would seek common ground with our brothers. And then he said, primarily, especially for those who have served on the field of battle. So today... We'd like to honor those in our cemetery that have served in the field that are now buried out here. So I'd like to read those names. They are printed in your bulletin, but we also have had to, had to add a couple more since we printed that bulletin. Algot Carlson, 
Edgar H. Cox, Frank Eckert, John William Elving, Walter Erickson, G. Hendrickson, Conrad W. Johnson, Fred Johnson, Herb Johnson, Larry Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Algie Larson, Earl R. Leafstead, Donald E. Lundberg, Merle Lundberg, Richard Merrick, Richard Moline, Richard Newman, Linus O. Nilsson, Andrew Oberg, Daryl Oberg, Harry Olson, Ralph W. Peterson, Oscar Gustav Sandquist, Ivar Stenstrom, Roger Stenstrom, Robert Stewart, Elmer Swanson, Kenneth Fallon, John Alfred Ward, Adelaine Wixon, John Wixon, Michael Tupker, and Don Petrie. In a moment here, we're going to take part in a moment of silence. And I'm going to invite our young ladies to come and get our flowers so that we can make a processional to the cemetery. After a moment of silence, then we will a cappella sing the doxology, and then we will head out to the cemetery for a brief service. Do you take give a moment of silence for these people, please? Please join me as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please join us out at the cemetery. <laughs> 